Rachel Griffith is the Sustainability Director at the Chester County Planning Commission. She provides leadership and coordination between county departments, municipalities, and a host of community partners to implement the county's climate action plan. She oversees the work of the Planning Commission's Sustainability Division and coordinates the activities of the county's Environmental and Energy Advisory Board. Additionally, Rachel leads planning efforts related to open space preservation in the county. Prior to working for Chester County, Rachel worked in the nonprofit and private sectors as a landscape architect. Rachel is a registered landscape architect and certified planner, and she holds a master's in public administration from the University of Pennsylvania and a BS in landscape architecture from Temple University. So at this point, I will turn things over to Rachel to get us started. Thank you, Amy. I'm gonna share my screen now. All right, hopefully everything looks good. Um, but thank you for inviting me to come speak with the, the Jenkins community tonight. I was really excited when you asked me. And so for our audience, I was excited because Amy used to be my supervisor at one of my first internships when I was at Temple at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. And I picked this picture just for Amy because it has skunk cabbage in it. <laughs> and and uh, something I remember about my internship was one of the naturalists there who led the tours talked about skunk cabbage being a bear laxative. And that like at, at the end of the winter, when the bears are coming out of hibernation, they'd eat all the skunk cabbage and it was so horrible that it would just get things moving again. And every time I see skunk cabbage, I think of that. And it is skunk cabbage season, so why not? So um, it's always good to start with a little laxative joke, I think. But anyway, um, tonight we're going to be talking about not bear laxatives, but um, three of my favorite topics, which are trees, policy, and data. And so hopefully um, that gets you excited too. And if so, you're in the right place. So um, just so I get a feel for who's in the audience, I'm hoping that we can launch a poll right now that has three questions and um, it sort of will give me an idea for where everybody's coming from, how much you know about this topic and um, just sort of what brings you here tonight. So there's three questions in this poll that's, that's launched. So if everybody could just take a minute and answer the three questions. And we'll give it maybe about 20 seconds or so. You may see my cat periodically pop in. How are we doing, Amy, on responses? <laughs> We're doing great. Okay. <laughs> I also have my cat with me. <laughs> it's cat night on Zoom. It is. Cats and trees. What could be better? All right. So where are we percentage-wise? We're getting there. Okay. I'm just going to we'll give, give it a couple more seconds. Oh, yeah. A lot are popping in right there. All right. All right, we're going to end the poll and I will share those results. Okay, so um, only 51% of you are lovers of trees. Hopefully it'll be different after this. Um, all right, so a lot of people have some knowledge and a lot of people from Chester County, which makes sense because the title of this presentation is about Chester County. So I'll, I'll try to hit on a few Delco and Montco and Philly things here and there where, where I know, um, but that's helpful for me, so thank you. So um, for, for those of you who may not know who the Chester County Planning Commission is or what we do, um, we are an advisory body that is part of Chester County government. And we provide 
planning support mostly for municipal governments around a wide variety of topics. So planning, I kind of like to think of it as the intersection between the natural and the built environment, how people interact with the natural and built environment, and how people, the natural and built environment interact with people. So it's kind of like a very intertwined, interconnected system. Um, but so some of the things that we plan for are open space preservation, natural resource protection, historic preservation, livable communities, economic development, and infrastructure. So it's pretty much everything, um, all parts of the world that we live in. Um, and so because we're advisory, um, in that that's sort of how the system works in Pennsylvania the local governments like municipal governments have a a lot of power over what happens from a land use perspective and so you'll hear me talk about that a lot tonight that um you know some of the the things that the planning commission does we try to create resources and provide some information on best practices um, but ultimately, a lot of these decisions around um, tree protection, woodland preservation, things like that, rely with municipal government. So um, just a quick little primer on um, kind of the main thing that the Planning Commission, um, our, our main tool in our toolbox is the county's comprehensive plan, which is a long range plan that talks about sort of broad policy goals about how the county should grow and develop over time. And there are six goals um, in our comprehensive plan, which is called Landscapes 3. And half of the goals are related to preservation and half are related to growth. So you see along the left-hand side, um, these are the names of our, our goals um, that each relate to a different area of planning. Um, and so this is really a plan to balance growth with preservation. So in my role, um, I primarily interact with the preserve and protect goals. And so preserve is all about preserving open space. Um, and I'll talk, talk about this a little bit more um, later on this evening, but there, there is a significant amount of Chester County that has been preserved and that is certainly not by accident. And so as we sort of um, continue on our preservation journey, we're thinking about how to prioritize preservation um, and, and be a little bit more strategic and also to think about more of a regional approach um, to how open space preservation can support ecosystems and habitat and things like that. And we're also um, really doing a lot because, because we've preserved so much, we have all these landscapes that need stewardship. And so um, figuring out how to bring resources to the groups who do, who do that stewardship. So, and then the next, the next goal is this protect goal, which is really around natural resources preservation and protection um, and water quality. And so some of the things that we do um, to advance this goal are smart growth, like the, the whole concept of planning, putting growth in places where there's infrastructure and not sensitive natural resources and not putting it in the more far-flung areas that don't have access to transportation and don't have um, great infrastructure and have a lot more sensitive natural resources. And then also, um, once again, local municipalities, um, they have a lot of control within their, their ordinances to, for how, how forests, woodlands, riparian buffers, wetlands, how these things can be um, protected when land is being developed. And so we, we try to provide best practices and outreach on, on those topics. Um, and so that was, a, that's our main policy document. And so there's, there's kind of a new policy document in town um, uh, that the planning commission is also in charge of um, helping to implement and helping to promote. And that's our climate action plan. And this was adopted in 2021. Um, and so it was it was kind of a big deal for the county to adopt a climate action plan. And I will say that in um, 
but for southeastern Pennsylvania counties, we were the first. And um, Delaware County is currently working on their climate action plan, which is part of an overall sustainability plan. And also um, a number of municipalities in Montgomery County are currently working on their climate action plan. So, um, and same in Bucks, Bucks County is also working on theirs. So, um, you know, 10 years ago, from a, a policy perspective and a political perspective, um, climate action was not something that we were talking about in county government. And um, so the fact that it it is now, it's embraced, it's at the forefront of a lot of conversations, um, we can actually do some things about it. And so there's a number of actions in the plan, somewhere around 140, I think. And so um, because there's the, the support from a political perspective, we actually have the, the potential to get some really interesting and impactful stuff done. So um, a couple things about the plan. Um, it is a greenhouse gas reduction plan. It's not um, an adaptation plan. It's not a climate mitigation plan. Um, it's really how do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Chester County by 80% of 2005 levels by 2050. And this aligns with the regional goal and also with the state's goal. So that's how we chose that. Um, but when we were doing this plan, we threw out through the process that learned that emissions are already trending downwards. And so um, that's great news. And it's just a matter of how can we really continue that, that downward trajectory at a steeper curve. Um, and so the plan is really, um, it's, its main intent is to identify actions that can continue that progress. And so it's important to note that it is not just a plan for county government, but is it is also a plan for everybody. And so there's actions in the plan that are indicated for municipalities, for residents, for businesses, environmental groups, transportation organizations. Um, there's something in it for everybody. And so part of my role is to not only help facilitate um, some of the actions in the county government, but also to do the outreach with all of you and the organizations you might be involved in with Jenkins Arboretum um, to, to help you understand what some of the things that you could do are um, that are listed in the Climate Action Plan and to help provide resources to do those. So um, the, the plan is based on the source of greenhouse gas emissions. So where those emissions are coming from. And um, our, our modeling that we did through the plan showed that the emissions are coming from four different sectors, really, um, with the main one being from the energy used by buildings. And the secondary one being transportation and just generally land use, like how, how spread out things are, um, whether you know things are within bikeable distance, whether communities are walkable, things like that. And then to a lesser extent, um, waste that's cut, the, the methane and, and landfill gases that are generated through landfills because of the waste that's produced. And then this other category of agriculture, food, and forestry, which is primarily um, for, through agriculture and food waste that the greenhouse gases are, are produced. So um, the plan is set separated into those categories. So like I said, for buildings and energy, we found that 62% of Chester County's emissions, and this is not just county government, this is Chester County as a whole, um, came from buildings and energy. And so some, these are just some sample actions um, just to illustrate the, the types of things that the plan is recommending. Um, so there's always actions for county facilities and operations. That's this little wrench symbol. And then for everybody else, the whole community. And so for county facilities, things that we're working on are incorporating energy saving measures in our buildings, which by the way, also saves money. 
Um, incorporating green building standards into new construction and any major renovations we would do for a county facility. And then also we've been working on trying to think about how we procure electricity in a different way so that we can actually buy renewably generated electricity rather than just um, offsets, which is what we've been doing, offsetting 100% of our electricity with um, renewable energy credits. So those are some things that are actions that we're working on. And then for the, the community-wide, um, this is a one that's geared towards municipalities, um, which is adopting alternative energy ordinances um, and streamlining the approval processes for things like if you're trying to put solar panels on your house. Um, what One of the major barriers to installing solar these days, if you're just a regular homeowner or a business owner, is just the the approval process and all of the documentation that you have to provide in a lot of municipalities. And by the way, it's different in all the municipalities. So it makes it really tricky for the installers. And so those soft costs really add up. Um, so moving on to the transportation and land use, this is 27% of the county's greenhouse gas emissions. So just over a quarter. So we're trying to install EV charging stations at county facilities, including our parks and trails. So hopefully in a year or so, you'll start to see those popping up. Um, and remote work, establishing policies for that. Um, this was kind of an easy one because of COVID. And um, we, we can, the county's being pretty generous with their remote work policy, um, which is really helpful from a transportation demand management perspective and also from um, just a greenhouse gas perspective. And then community-wide, um, communities, particularly local municipalities, can work on developing their sidewalk and trail networks so that um, there are connections be between places like a housing development and a grocery store that's half a mile away um, so that people don't have to get in their car to go everywhere. And then also advancing transit projects, um, which is a several measures more difficult than um, sidewalk and trail projects. But there are some, some exciting um, transit projects in the works um, that, that could make riding the bus or taking a train easier because we don't always have the best transit access out here. Waste management, um, this is 3% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And so for the county, we're trying to create a waste diversion plan for um, just all the waste the county produce, produces. Figure out what, what types of waste we're producing and figure out how to um, not produce that or to send it somewhere where it can be reused or recycled. And then community-wide, um, adopting sustainable practices, things like um, source reduction. So there's a lot of municipalities passing um, bans on single-use plastics. Um, there's uh, municipalities that are starting to think about composting. Um, and then also adaptive reuse in terms of, um, you know, reusing historic buildings instead of tearing them down. Not only does it contribute to the sense of place, but the most sustainable building is one you don't have to build. So being able to reuse an old building um, is definitely an example of this, this waste management category. And then the agriculture, food, and forestry category is pretty interesting because it's the only category that can, that there are carbon emissions that come from this category through the agriculture industry and from, from food waste, but also. Um, this is the only category that has the potential to sequester carbon and make things better. And so there's kind of a push and pull with this category. And so this is what we're mostly going to be talking about today, um, because trees and woodlands fall into this category. Um, and so, you know, like I said, this is the only category where you can, that sequesters carbon, that takes it out of the atmosphere, puts it back in the soil where it belongs. And so it's healthy woodlands and healthy soil that are best at that. And so we at the Planning Commission are really trying to um, 
help spread spread knowledge and create resources around healthy soil management and healthy woodland management because a healthy woodland is much more able to store and sequester carbon than an unhealthy one and there's lots of data around that so um some of the actions and these on this slide are all related to county government these are kind of the tools that are in our toolbox related to trees and so one is simply that we could reforest our own lands that we own um, and which we're starting to think about and also manage that land um, a little bit better than we have been. And so can we develop sustainable landscape management plans? Can we develop natural resource management plans for our, our county parks and things like that? And then also um, we we provide funding for open space preservation throughout the county. And so can we use that funding to incentivize woodland protection and maybe um, you know, have, have provisions in place that there needs to be a woodland management plan in order to be eligible for funding, things like that. And then also um, technical assistance to municipalities who once again are at um, the ground zero of land use planning and land use decisions. And so can we provide model ordinances and things that promote conservation of woodlands, require tree replacement when land is being developed and protect important trees during construction. And then so for everybody else, um, there, there's all sorts of things in the, the climate action plan related to, to trees. Um, and, and forests. And so preserving woodlands, um, this is another municipal thing that people can advocate for. So um, many municipalities in Chester County have their own open space tax that's in place to fund local open space preservation efforts. And so uh, municipalities can proactively preserve woodlands in their municipality. Also, um, from sort of a bang for your buck perspective, a, a tree planted in an urban setting is just incredibly valuable from a, from a property value standpoint, from a, a health outcomes perspective, from public safety. There's tons of data that many of you have probably heard around um, urban trees, trees in the places where a lot of people live um, and how valuable they are from a monetary perspective. And so we're thinking at the Planning Commission of what we can do to support tree plantings in urban settings. And also there's a lot of lawn around. If you drive around, um, you will see a lot of lawn. And it's certainly, it's an aesthetic. It's the aesthetic that a lot of people have. Um, but there are costs to lawns. Um, if you're using a, a gas-powered lawnmower, um, you're using that fossil fuel, you're bothering your neighbors with the sound of the mower, um, maybe you're fertilizing your lawn, and that comes from fossil fuels, and um, it's just sort of like ripple effects of the lawn. So we're really um, encouraging lawn conversion projects, especially for lawns that nobody's using and they're just really there for aesthetic purposes. Um, and then tree and woodland management. So this is if you've got a little patch of woods in your at your house or at your work, or um, you, you have one at your local park, um, Woodlands are low, ma low maintenance, but they are not no maintenance. And so they, they do require a little bit of, a little bit of management. So we see lots of trees all over the place, especially here in Chester County. And um, I just talked about a lot of resources that are being devoted to the tree issue. And you may be thinking, what's the problem? Um, that we, we've got a lot of trees, people here like trees, what's the issue? And I maybe, maybe you all are on the same page, but I really feel, especially these days, like trees are under attack. And I have a couple of these really goofy PowerPoint transitions that I could not help myself 
But um, so this is the Southern Pine Bark Beetle. And it's a picture of Nottingham County Park, which is in the southwestern part of the county. And it's actually designated as a National Natural Historic Landmark. I think that's what it's called because of the serpentine barrens that are there that are unique even among other serpentine barrens um, in the area. And maybe about five years ago, the trees started dying, these, these pitch pine trees. And um, they're very unique to the area. And it took us a while to figure out what was going on. But when we did, we realized it was this Southern pine beetle that did not used to live in Pennsylvania that was seen here kind of for the first time and, um, and was attacking the trees. And if you were to go to Nottingham Park today, this looks completely different because the trees are gone. And, you know, I, I remember taking walks last summer thinking 2022, I will remember as the year all the ash trees died because, you know, for a couple of years, we were seeing them kind of get more, more and more sickly as the emerald ash borer got them. And last year, just all of a sudden, just huge swaths of ash trees that were dead. And so it seems like we're experiencing more and more of these um, bugs or fungi or things that are atta attacking our native trees. And um, we're, we're going to have some pieces to pick up um, once once there's these huge die-offs, like with the ash and the pines. Um, and so in a rural context, or really in any context, this is really relevant to a, a carbon and climate change perspective. Um, because like I said, healthier woodlands have more of a potential to sequester and store carbon. And so when you're getting huge die-offs and there's big gaps in the canopy, that gives the invasive species a a chance to come in and take over the woodland and make it not so healthy anymore and restrict future trees from growing. And so um, it's a big deal. From a habitat perspective, it's an even bigger deal. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of reforestation, forest management, that sort of work to be done. From a suburban context, um, there's also a problem. And so the this long picture here is um, something I drive by almost every day and it bothers me, but there's a housing development that was built and these trees were planted along a trail and nobody mows where the trees are. And so they're being outcompeted by all these, these weeds that aren't being mowed. Um, maybe they're not weeds, maybe they're just grasses, but either way, um, they don't have any protection from deer, they're, they're not mulched. Um, and so, so they're dead. And after a development goes in, the, the contractor can walk away after a year if the trees are still alive. Um, but, you know, they, maybe they died three years later, and then whose responsibility is it? So um, there, there's lots of things like this, especially in these developments where um, there's not that much of a mandate to take care of the trees. Um, and so this picture over here is a picture um, that I got from Stroud Water Research Center. And so it shows that you really need a tree tube when you're establishing a tree, because otherwise the deer are just gonna rub it and it or eat it and it's not going to live. And they've also been doing work um, piloting a stone mulch that um, you know lasts longer than wood mulch, requires less maintenance, but also um, protects the lawnmower from hitting it. A lot of trees in suburban settings have lawnmower damage. So there's lots of things um, that can that can hurt or or kill the trees um, and prevent prevent our our forest canopy from flourishing. And then in an urban context, the trees have even more to worry about. So these are some photos I. I got from Will Williams, who is the sustainability director in Westchester. He gave a presentation at um, one of our events last year uh, about all of the things that urban trees in Westchester face. And so you see a student driver who's about to back into one along the street. Um, you see this guy, this is actually an apple tree and he's had enough of the apples dropping on his car. But it's not the apple tree's fault. Perhaps it shouldn't have been planted as a street tree. So 
Um, urban trees have all sorts of things to face, but these are also the trees that, like I said, have a, can have the highest value for people and for communities. So with all that, um, it was kind of a downer, but now I can talk about the good things that are happening. So these are things that we're up to at the Planning Commission and at Chester County in general. So you can't really talk about tree preservation um, without talking about open space preservation because that's perhaps the biggest thing that we're doing um, because we have a program for open space preservation in the county. Um, and so, you know, the best way to protect the trees is to preserve the land that they're planted on, basically. So as of 2021, year end, our numbers for 2022 haven't come out yet, but 30% of the county officially was permanently preserved. And so that's, that's a big deal. Um, and it, it did not get that way by accident. And um, like I said, we have a funding program for open space preservation that we've had for the past 30 years. And so that's sort of what's been accomplished, but that the funding that the county has provided has leveraged so much other funding from local municipalities, from the state, from the feds, um, from private landowners donating easements, um, conservation easements, agricultural easements, things like that. Um, and so, you know, 30 years into having this program, open space is still something that's a high priority for many, many, many of our residents. And when we did, when we were updating our comprehensive plan, we did a big survey, countywide survey, and open space in the environment was the topic that the most number of people by far indicated as the, the thing that they cared most about, basically. So um, we take that seriously and we, we, um, we do a lot of, of work around those issues. And so, but, but preserving open space is different than it was 30 years ago when we started. We've got a growing population. And so um, those people need more access to parks um, or they're living in smaller, more dense communities than, than they used to be. And so um, where are they gonna recreate? Where are they going to um, take, a, take a scenic walk, interact with nature? In, during the pandemic, we saw lots of supply chain shortages that are still hanging around. Um, and so this is where access to local food and local agriculture becomes really important, um, both from a consumer perspective, but also within the agriculture industry, them having each other, the, the mushroom farms having the hay um, and the being able to send their compost places. Um, it's, it's all sort of an interconnected web that requires a critical mass of farms. And then climate change, um, obviously, and, and the local impacts. Um, open space can be hugely beneficial when, when you're talking about flooding. Um, so not building right up to the floodplain, floodplain preservation, planting trees within the floodplain. Um, and so, so we're really starting to think about things in a different way than, than just straight urban suburban sprawl that, that we had been talking about that was really um, what precipitated our open space program 30 years ago. So from a policy perspective, this is within our county's comprehensive plan, that policy plan document. Um, there's kind of three ways that um, open space preservation plays into that th from a policy perspective. So one is how much of the viable farmland that's in the county is preserved. The second one is um, the, this idea that connecting larger tracts of open space to one another along natural corridors like bridge lines and streams um, provides a lot of benefit from an ecological and habitat perspective. And so how big are these conservation clusters? Are we filling the gaps within these conservation clusters? And then are we preserving the corridor that connects them to each other? And also access to parks. We have a goal that all residents are within a half mile of a park. Um, and this is especially important in urban areas, like I said, where people don't necessarily have a big backyard of their own. 
Um, and so that's something that we track and incentivize too. And all of these things are incentivized through our open space preservation program. So it's kind of the way we put our money where our mouth is. And then back to the municipalities, um, they're very important when it comes to open space preservation. Um, and so about half of Chester County municipalities have an open space tax in place, a locally funded program. Um, I think this does not show Westtown Township, and they are the most recent township to put an open space tax in place. West Sadsbury actually just got rid of their tax. They felt like they had achieved their goals. Um, but there's a, aside from the tax, there's a number of other things municipalities can do to preserve open space. Um, firstly, you can plan um, to create a plan that really identifies what your vision is and what your goals are. Um, and so if you are a municipality that has a lot of woodlands, maybe woodland preservation is something that's very important. Um, and you could put any properties that you desire to preserve in the future on what's called an official map to show um, that the municipality is really serious about preserving that land. Um, and it sort of gives the municipality a little bit more right um, to, to purchase it when it comes up for sale. So um, moving out of the, the comprehensive plan a little bit, um, this is some of the, the, the data crunching. This is where the data comes in. Um, we've got our policy piece, and then we've got providing resources to municipalities and doing outreach about the resources. And so, um, we produce a lot of data. We've got some great mapping people in our office. And um, so this is a map that uses some really cool data that we recently got a hold of that shows the, the average tree cover in each municipality. And so we can use this data for all sorts of interesting things. And so this is our... Um, natural resource priority protection area policy map from the comprehensive plan. And so things that we do are we look at the tree cover map and then we compare it with where the important and sensitive natural resource areas are. And then we might say, hey, I see that there's not, there, there could be more forest up in this kind of a north, north central part of the county on the west. Um, and it's in this exceptional value and high quality drainage area. And so maybe we could do some outreach to these municipalities to talk to them about what they might do in their ordinances to protect woodlands or to um, incentivize tree replacement standards um, when a property is being developed. Um, we also talk to a lot of the watershed organizations and the land conservancies, and we, we try to have a, a coordinated approach. Um, I know the Brandywine Conservancy does a lot of work in up in Honeybrook Township because it's the headwaters of the Brandywine Creek. And so at some point, I think the city of I, was it Wilmington or Newark, was helping to fund open space preservation up in Honeybrook because they were finding it had a big impact on downstream water quality. And so um, that, that's an example of looking at things from a, a regional perspective um, because things that happen upstream really do have big impacts. So another thing we can do with the data is um, look at county properties and what we might do to reforest our own properties. This is the beautiful government services center that I work at in West Goshen Township. And so um, this the green is from our the tree cover data. And so we might decide that we want to put it put some more trees um, and do a tree planting. We've got a, a committee that um, of of county employees that takes on projects like this. And so maybe this will be a project of our, our committee. And so we'll be looking at all of our county properties to see if there's kind of some low hanging fruit areas for reforestation projects. 
Another thing um, we're doing with the data is some outreach to the urban centers in Chester County about what they could do to kind of strategically combat the urban heat island effect. And so this is kind of a crazy little outline of the borough of Downingtown. And um, so once again, the green is the existing tree cover. And then we also have impervious surfaces. And so when there's not much tree cover and there's lots of impervious surfaces, there is um, urban heat island. And so this, this layer shows basically the surface temperature and how much it deviates from the county mean. And so over here in this area, for some reason, it's, it's less than the county mean. In this orange area, it is up to five degrees warmer than the county average. And then this area outside the borough, and this is by census tract, so that's why it's blocky like this, um, or census block rather. Um, this is much higher than the average surface temperature. Um, and so when you're thinking about um, tree cover and urban heat island, um, you might start to identify some some areas that might make sense to do some tree plantings, whether it's street trees or um, tree giveaway programs for people's backyards or um, tree plantings in parks, things like that. And so just quickly looking at this map, these were some areas that I thought might make sense for tree plantings. This one over here, because there's an elementary school right here, there's, a, there's uh, the Beaver Creek, um, which has some erosion issues. And so maybe, maybe some tree plantings in this area might make sense. Or down here, um, we see that there's this big swath of, of forest down here. This is a steep slope. And then we've got another one along the, uh, the Amtrak line. Um, and so maybe doing some more reforestation in this area might kind of fill that gap and might be good from a habitat perspective. Or over here, um, this is along the east branch of the Brandywine Creek, which um, is notorious for flooding and it was flooded tons of people out during Hurricane Ida. There's a, there's a lot of people who still haven't been able to go back to their homes. Um, it was really bad in Downingtown. And um, so maybe there are some things you can do along the creek um, to, to plant some trees and, and protect people from flooding. And so just looking at that, that creek area, if you zoom in a little bit, um, you see that, oh, look, there's a park right here, and this is all lawn. And oh, look, this is a property belonging to Downingtown Borough, and it's all lawn. And down here is another park, and it's all lawn. And it, granted, um, I'm not saying that all this, this lawn is like definitely should not be there. I mean, I know this is used as sports fields down here at the southern part. Um, but what if you planted trees there? Um, these would all be potentially great sites for, um, for tree plantings. And you would just be working with one landowner, the borough. So um, we also, in addition to the mapping, um, this is just a screenshot from a new website that we created that has a whole bunch of resources related to all things trees. And um, I believe that Jenkins is going to put up some links um, after the presentation. So this will, I'll be sure to link this. Um, but we've got lists of funding sources um, that pay for that pay for big tree planting projects and, and programs. Um, also resources around planting and maintaining new trees um, because that's just as important as planting them in the first place. We've got um, our guidance and best practices um, for municipalities on tree protection and replacement standards, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and we, we create these things at the Planning Commission called e-tools, which are basically um, kind of the quick and dirty version of everything you'd need to know about uh, any given topic related to planning. Um, and so we've got e-tools related to things like street trees and um, urban heat island and uh, woodland protection, things like that. So um, 
best practices to preserve trees during development. Um, when development happens, like whether it's somebody building a new garage at their house or um, a, a whole new housing or commercial development that's being proposed, there are a number of ways that trees can be um, protected or incentivized. And um, so one of them is to, and these are all these are all in a municipality's zoning or subdivision ordinance. And so um, hopefully I won't get too wonky on this because I could go on and on. But um, so we recommend that municipalities set a specific limit of disturbance. So if say there's a hundred acre site that's being developed and 60 acres of it is woodland, um, the the ordinance should have some qualifier in there that says um, you you cannot disturb more than fifty percent of a of a wooded area or thirty percent of a wooded area on a site, depending on um, whether it's a residential or commercial development, or depending on um, kind of the whether it's on a steep slope, things like that. So having a specific um, disturbance limit is really important. Also, um, having standards for protecting trees that are existing during construction, establishing a buffer around them, a fence, some kind of some kind of buffer and protection um, of the of the trees that are trying to be protected during construction, um, and and also tree replacement standards are are important. Um, some municipalities have these, and some some do not. So, like if if an ordinance says that you can remove or disturb 50% of a woodland that's on site, it may say, oh, but by the way, you also have to replace um, every tree that was over six inches wide in diameter with three smaller trees or something like that. So um, from our perspective, it's much better to um, protect the trees that are there in the first place than to require new trees to be planted. And it's great to reply, re require new trees to be planted, don't get me wrong, but it takes a long time for a forest to grow. And generally, um, a pre-development condition is much easier for a tree to grow in and more hospitable conditions. You know, there's not all the compaction, um, there's not people around hanging on the trees, um, less road salt in the pre-development condition. And so um, protecting the trees that are there is really important. Um, and, and the best way to do that is to restrict the amount of disturbance. And now you can't be overly restrictive. You can't say 0%. Um, you may not even be able to say 25% um, if there's not like some kind of underlying condition about steep slopes or um, some other important natural feature. But you've got to, in Pennsylvania, you have to be able to let people use their property um, and have it have it still be viable. So um, we also have some, some lists of recommended tree species. Some municipalities choose to, um, in their ordinance, recommend to homeowners or developers what species um, they should be they should be replacing with they should be requiring on the site that's being developed and um there more and more we're seeing that some of those species change a little bit or some some that used to be recommended aren't recommended anymore because of climate change um, and because the types of trees that used to do well here particularly some of the evergreen trees um, no longer do because it's just a little bit too warm for them Okay, so that that was what um, we at the county tried to do to encourage, incentivize, and promote trees and woodlands. Um, but here's some things that might be a little bit more relevant to you. So, like I said and have been saying, um, you're probably all sick of hearing it, is that municipalities in Pennsylvania control land land use, how how land is used, basically. And so um, they control how well natural resources are protected during construction, like we just talked about. 
they control um, whether the municipality has an open space preservation program and whether they're proactively pursuing open space preservation. They control the municipality's codes and their zoning ordinance, how much density is permitted on a, on a certain, um, certain part of the municipality, et cetera. Um, they also control the, their, own, their own structure. So if there is an environmental advisory council, the, the elected officials control that. Um, same with the Shade Tree Commission. They decide what the structure will be. Not every municipality has a Shade Tree Commission or an environmental advisory council. So um, getting involved in your municipality is a great way to have an impact. Um, there's lots of ways you can join. Chester County has 73 separate municipalities. Montgomery County has 63, and there's 49 in Delaware County. Um, there are lots of opportunities to get involved. Um, and if you don't get involved, um, just attending the meetings and becoming um, conscious of the types of decisions that are made and the things that are going on and advocating for things that are important to you um, is really helpful because oftentimes if you go to a local government meeting, there's only a couple people there. And so if you're the one person who stands up and says something, people are gonna listen to you. Um, your voice can really be heard in the, the local government sphere. So other ways to get involved, um, joining or volunteering for your local watershed group. So um, I put this link in here that can be posted later, but um, there's a neat little tool to find kind of your local environmental group um, that, that you can get involved with. We talked about um, big tree plantings. Um, those trees do not maintain themselves, especially when they're young. Their tubes need to be checked to make sure they're not damaged or don't have vines growing up through them, um, that they're, the bases of them aren't choked with invasive species, et cetera. Um, volunteering to maintain a tree planting could be really, really helpful for somebody. Um, if you live in an HOA, um, HOAs often, um, often don't have a ton of resources. And so maybe they're just thinking about, we, we just, our job is to just mow the lawn and we don't wanna do anything else. Um, but you could, if, if there's a big lawn area that um, maybe would be better as a, a woodland in the long run, maybe you could advocate for that that tree planting to happen and potentially volunteer to, to help make it happen. There's also lots of um, volunteer programs where you can learn about something and then volunteer with your newfound knowledge. And many of you probably know about these programs, but just a couple of them are um, one that Natural Lands runs called the Force of Nature program. And um, that's it. It's a, a training program to help steward natural lands, basically. Um, and then there's the Master Watershed Stewards that teaches you all sorts of things you need to know about healthy, healthy watersheds. Um, and then there's a volunteer um, and education requirement so that you, you sort of go out into your community and be the leader when it comes to volunteer projects and education and things like that. Same with the Master Naturalist Program um, and the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society's Tree Tenders Program, which teaches you mostly about street trees and how to plant, maintain, and advocate for them. There's also a program um, that I wanted to bring up called the Keystone 10 Million Trees Partnership. And this is only going on for the next couple of years, I believe. Um, but there's two orders placed per year. And if you are a homeowner, and especially um, if you're in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, but you do not have to be in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, you, can, you can get some free trees. And these are native trees and shrubs. Um, also, if you're part of an EAC or something like that, and you want to do a tree planting in a park or, or something, you can order trees through this program. They come with tree tubes um, so that hopefully there's a, a better survival rate. And um, so also if you're a homeowner, there's a priority if you've got a stream in your yard or if you've got some kind of riparian area because it's um, 
it's it's was intended to be a water quality program, but also um, for all the benefits that trees provide. And um, also, if you are lucky enough to have some woods in your own yard, um, like I said, woodlands are low maintenance, but not no maintenance. And there are ways to manage your, your woodland um, for the most carbon sequestration and storage potential. And so this is a little chart um, that I like from a, a really great publication um, that provides basic information on this topic um, from Massachusetts. And basically, um, if, it, if you have a mature woodland, that the, the carbon storage, so that's the, the amount of total carbon that's stored within the body of the tree, um, is higher because the plants are bigger, makes sense. Um, but the plants aren't growing as much, especially when the canopy fills in. So it's when the canopy is growing and when the trees are growing that the trees are sequestering, actively sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and putting it into the body of the tree, into the soil, into the roots, um, into the leaves that are then, then decay and become part of the soil. Um, and so it's kind of this dance between um, managing your forest to optimize its carbon storage and carbon sequestration. And so this is something you might want to have a forester help you with, but there's lots of things that you could be optimizing for when you have um, a forest that you're, you're managing and maintaining. So um, beauty could be one, habitat could be one, biodiversity, et cetera, but um, consider carbon sequestration and storage as another. And then I wanted to leave things um, on this note. So this is something um, that comes up a lot in my work. Um, and it, it sort of leaves me feeling that nature is misunderstood sometimes. And, you know, I talked a little about the lawn aesthetic and I, I wanna be clear, neither Rachel Griffith nor Chester County want anybody to get rid of your lawn. Um, that's not what we're saying. What, what I'm saying is that there are other aesthetics that other people like, and um, we should not be standing in the way of other people and, and their aesthetics. And so, you know, there, there's things in place um, that, that kind of force an aesthetic on everybody that, that we're starting to see some pushback on some municipalities rethinking their property maintenance codes that say that which were really intended to be anti-blight um, codes so like you know if a house was abandoned there would be some enforcement mechanism that would say okay you can't let your lawn grow above a foot um, even though you know nobody's living there and so these things are still hanging on even though we don't have a ton of blight especially in chester county um, and so people are trying to do things like grow meadows in their front yard or in their backyard, and they're running up against code violations. Um, and so what can we all do to be a little bit more accommodating of, um, of aesthetics and of, of nature, really, that is going to draw habitat, it's going to draw animals um, that we have sort of like pushed out to the periphery with our lawns. And so, um, and it's similarly in urban environments, um, you know, you often hear that, oh, this tree is dirty. It drops all these leaves. It drops all these stinky fruits um, in the case of the poor female ginkgo tree. And um, it's, it, that's just kind of a matter of the right tree, the right place. You know, trees, are, trees aren't dirty. It's just not what you want in that location. And so, I think it's important um, for us all to be at peace with nature and to not um, be, as we move into this, this world where we're concerned about climate change, um, where we're trying to make better decisions about how we manage our land, um, it's important to, to live in harmony with nature and, and to, to let that be okay um, through our codes, through our policies, um, and through our interactions with our neighbors and, and with each other. And so with that, 
I will end things and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you, Rachel. That was awesome. If you want to stop sharing your screen, we can sure. come back together for questions. Although I know that does take away your um, contact information, um, but maybe we can get you to put that in the chat for folks or I can include that in um, the email that I send out. Sure. All right. Great. I'm seeing in the in the question, someone said, don't forget Bucks County. We 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 don't mean to forget Bucks County. That's actually, as Rachel mentioned, that's where her and I first met. <laughs> it is. Bucks County. Um, so we'll kick it off with, does Chester County have a numeric percentage goal for land preservation? And does that include farmland? So the short answer is no. And um, we we have an internal strategic plan that um, the current goal, it's a five-year plan, and the current goal for, I think, 2023 or four is 32%. And so the expectation is that that might just get bumped up every strategic plan, but there hasn't been any talk about um, having a big a big goal. This question is in reference to um, potential storms and floodwaters with climate change. Um, is there a plan to protect trees from more severe storms um, and floodwaters that, that may come with climate change? That's a good question. There is not a plan, um, but it sounds like something that might be fun to work on. Um, I know that Philadelphia just finished a big sort of master plan for trees um, for their urban forest and, um, you know, taking climate change into consideration in that plan. And so maybe that's something that we consider here, um, especially with things not just like climate change happening to trees, um, but also like all the pests that I was talking about. And like, what do we do when these huge swaths of, of a certain kind of tree die off? What's the succession plan? But it's a good thought. Yeah. So this question came in when you were discussing kind of like the, the percentages of greenhouse gases um, that were being used. And they chimed in about, you know, what about corporate park and townhouse community landscaper use of gas leaf blowers and huge use of huge amounts of high nitrogen fertilizers that covers a huge part of Chester County with those services? I think that would be included in that agriculture, food, and forestry um, category. And I do not have in front of me a list of all of the different um, itemized things that go into that. But I mean, thinking about it, yeah, it's it's true. I mean, there's a huge amount of agriculture here. And, um, and so, you know, a lot of them do use fertilizers. So is it is it three percent worth? That's that's what our data shows. Does the Chester County plan have a tree canopy goal for the county, or for suburban or urban places in the county? We don't we don't have a tree canopy goal. Um, so this mapping that we did is kind of like the first step. And I think it might lead to some of these things um, that are a little bit more aspirational and strategic. Um, we, we did run across a really interesting tool that it gives a tree equity score. And so you can type in your um, the place that you live. I don't think it does it by zip code, but based on a number of demographic um, considerations like how percentage of kids, percentage of older adults, percentage of people in poverty, et cetera, um, percentage of minorities. And then looking at the existing tree cover, it sort of gives what a, a goal tree cover should be um, and, the, and what it currently is. And so 
that's kind of a neat tool to start with. Um, I'd have to dig more into the methodology of sort of how they arrived at what the goal tree canopy cover is for each area. Um, but I think like people respond to numbers for sure. And so if we at the planning commission are doing our outreach to a municipality and saying, hey, you've got 11% tree cover, you should really try to get to 40. Um, that kind of gives you something tangible that you can work towards um, to, to figure out, okay, how are we gonna get to 40? Okay, we gotta do a tree planting here and one over here. Um, and, it, and I think it can be kind of motivational too. So it's a, it's a good suggestion. Yeah, and that's that's great because the follow-up question to that person's tree canopy goal question was actually about the tree equity score. Oh, um, perfect. Yeah. That's why we're so smiling. They, <laughs> yeah, they actually were asking if land cover data isn't available, what do you think of the tree equity score developed by American Forests? Or are there better online estimates available? That's actually the only estimate I know of that gives a recommendation. And so I showed you that chart um, that has, or the map rather, that is color coded based on the percentage of tree canopy cover in each municipality. And so we think that data is pretty good. And um, I'm not sure what data the tree equity score people are using, um, but I would imagine American Forest Foundation um, probably has good data. Mm -hmm. But um, but I would like to dig into that a little bit more and see what else is out there. Um, but, but it seemed like a really interesting tool as kind of a starting point to start conversations anyway, like a screening tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So this question is in regards to um, maybe a little bit of advice or direction. Um, they're seeing that there's senseless loss of mature trees due to ivy overgrowth. Um, and maybe what they could do um, to share some information with Chester County, um, like to residents, municipal zoning committees, business owners, um, if there's anything, I guess, that either Chester County or um, citizens can do to kind of promote that part. Um, that's a good question. I mean, the... I feel like the ivy overgrowth could get lumped into a category with all sorts of other things that take take over trees. And there is there is a bunch of um, literature and information out there around invasive species and mm -hmm. how to control them within a woodland setting or within just you know on a specimen tree. Um, so potentially going to your municipal meetings and raising the subject, especially, I mean, if you're seeing the issue on a tree that's on public property, that would probably be the most effective bet. Or just call your township manager or your, your borough manager and say, and let them know what you see. And they may just send a public works person out there. Um, if it's on private property, it's a little trickier. Um, you could always just knock on the door of the person depending on who it is, it could go well or it could not go well. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's kind of like, this is the problem that we have and, and probably a lot of organizations have is that you can get the information to the people who are already looking for it because they're interested in that sort of thing. It's the people who aren't gonna show up to a lecture or who are not gonna pick up a pamphlet because invasive species on trees is not something that interests them. Um, and so we haven't cracked that code yet, but I think, I think a lot of it is just people talking to each other too. Mm -hmm. So this question kind of piggybacks on um, the idea of unfortunately taking, taking down trees. So it says, are there any municipalities that have ordinances that prevent or limit existing homeowners or developments from cutting down trees. This person's lived in a 13 house cul-de-sac for 30 years and have seen dozens of trees taken down by neighbors, some just because they don't like leaves. Yes. Um, I was just looking at one fairly recently and um, I think it might've been Schuylkill Township. 
and they they had an ordinance that was I I want to say that they didn't even have an exception for dead or dying trees but maybe they did I don't quote me on that but it was very stringent um mm-hmm. and and you had to get permission to cut down anything from the township mm-hmm. And so that was kind of on a very far side of the spectrum, I think. But there, there are, um, in terms of people cutting down trees, I, I mean, you see a, a lot more of that in an urban setting. Um, in Westchester Borough, they have a tree ordinance that um, sort of establishes a chain of command of who is responsible for maintaining the tree, who is made responsible for cutting it down if it needs to be cut down, um, who's responsible for planting a tree, somebody put in Radner's um, ordinance. So yes, there are examples of that. And it, it just, it seems to be more common in um, hmm. more developed areas. So this actually moves right into someone making a comment about Schuylkill Township. Um, having a native plant ordinance in its subdivision land development ordinance. Um, And the question is, are there any other um, native plant ordinances in Chester County on the municipal level, I guess? Yeah, um, Schuylkill Townships is really good. Um, There's a lot of plants on that list. I think another one that we refer to is um, West, West Whiteland Townships. They ha- they have a pretty good list, and um, I think I was just looking at those the other day. They separated out by shade trees, street trees, trees for wet areas, et cetera. So it it kind of makes it easy to understand um, what type of tree would go in what place. But we do on our website um, under our under this tree trees and woodlands web page, um, we've got all sorts of resources about that with examples of municipal ordinances. So thinking about native plant ordinances, are there also um, lists for Chester County of tree species that are prohibited that might be invasive like tree of heaven or Bradford pear? Um, so I guess on the flip side, are there are there lists of things not to plant or that you know they're not able to? The ones that I have seen typically refer to the state's list of noxious, what what do they call it, noxious plants. So I'm pretty sure Bradford pears on that list. I think barberry just got added and um, burning bush. So that that's typically what I've seen is is not trying to keep up with what the latest noxious plant of the the year is, but rather referring to something that's already established that somebody else, it's their job to keep it up. Is there a higher environmental value to lawn to forest versus lawn to meadow? That's an interesting question. I I was at a, a conference last spring and it was given by, there, there was a talk given by some architects who do a lot of green building. And they were talking about um, how they were trying to manage landscapes for better carbon sequestration. Mm-hmm. And they said that they had seen, the research they were saying was that meadows are better at sequestering carbon than a well-managed forest. And I don't remember what that talk was about. And I will tell you, everybody in that talk was like, but what about the meadows? Like they they didn't listen to any of the green building stuff. And it was just sort of like counter to everything you have ever heard. Um, But I have since looked it up and some sources you see meadows and some sources you see woodlands. And so um, I, I guess I would say from a carbon perspective, who knows? It's it's really about um, it being well managed. And so, what does the area kind of want to be from a habitat perspective, from a use human use perspective, um, from an ecological perspective? I mean, if it's on a steep slope, maybe it wants to be a woodland. If it's in a, a low lying area that's surrounded by other woodlands, maybe it wants to be a woodland. Um, and so thinking about it from a landscape-wide perspective, 
and what would be most beneficial. Um, it, it would be a pretty case by case basis, I would think. Mm -hmm. So this question kind of comes back to the idea of uh, lists of recommended trees for plantings. This one says with some native trees under insect attack and with higher temperatures forecasted long term, do you recommend some non-native or more southern trees for new planting? Or right now is the recommendation to stick to current natives? Um, there are a couple lists that I think we have on our website um, related to this topic, trees and climate change. And from what I remember, the recommendation is actually just a smaller subset of trees than it once was. And so some of the trees that are native here are just better suited to these new, new conditions than others are. Um, and so at this point, I don't think that we're recommending, you know, planting all these Southern species up here. Um, but th this is not an area of my expertise, I will say, and you can probably tell from the way I'm answering this question, but DCNR has a really good resource um, on that kind of looks at species viability and it's sort of like trajectory based on where we're expecting the climate to go um, and how well a variety of different native trees will perform based on that trajectory. So I'll make sure that goes in the um, in the links that you post. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you for that. So this is the last question that we have right now. So those of you who are out there, if anyone has anything additional, um, otherwise this will be our grand finale. Um, what can be done about PICO and other utilities butchering trees or mass removals for their serv servicing convenience? Uh, end it with a hard one. I know. I Someone remember, come up with another question. Yeah. When I did the tree tenders program 15 years ago or something, I remember them talking about that they had done training for the Pico linemen. Um, they butchered all the trees in front of my house and, you know, they, they're trying to do it fast. So I think like one of these organizations like Pennsylvania Horticultural Society or Arbor Day or um, one of these like tree related um, nonprofits or state agencies, like who might have some leverage with PICO or these utility companies um, could provide some training. But as far as I know, I mean, it's kind of a part of their mandate to do the, the trimming. And so I don't know of any levers that can be pulled by a municipal government or, um, anyone else for that matter, other than just education. All right, anyone else for tonight? Otherwise, Rachel, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your expertise um, and allowing us to record tonight because now we have um, this wonderful presentation and information and resources to be able to share. Um, and we will get that out to everyone. And Rachel will share some of those links with me and I'll make sure that it gets in one pretty package for everyone. And hopefully you guys will be able to join us um, for next month's lecture, which is about native orchid conservation with Longwood Gardens. Um, and that'll be Thursday, April 20th. So hopefully you guys will be able to join us then. But Rachel, thank you again for being with us tonight. And um, we'll hopefully me. see everyone again soon. All right, good night, everybody.